Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Charles Lawton, Ella Raines, and Rosalind Evan in The Suspect. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Thomas Mitchell. Thank you. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Two nights a week in a veteran hospital not far from here, wounded and battle-worn soldiers gather around a visitor. This visitor keeps them enthralled with magic words delivered in an almost magic voice as he reads from Shakespeare, Milton, Shaw, and Dickens. For no one can surpass Charles Lawton in bringing life and warmth and color to the English language. He's standing in the wings tonight, and he's ready to bring us Universal's thrilling mystery, The Suspect, with Ella Raines as his leading lady. You know, the last time Miss Raines was on this stage, about a year ago, we called her a brand new Hollywood discovery. Tonight, we change that title to an established Hollywood success a star whose meteoric rise is happily supported by sincere and brilliant talent. And also in our cast tonight is Rosalind Evan, the gifted English actress whose ability to portray shrewish wives is in contradiction to a very gentle and delightful personality. All three appear in their original screen roles in a fateful triangle of marriage, love, and murder that makes for one of the season's most exciting and suspense-packed melodramas. In a minute, we'll take you to London in 1902, but while we're traveling, let's look in at Arabia in 1945. Perhaps you read in a recent copy of Life magazine an account of the King of Arabia's visit to an American destroyer on his way to Yalta. Well, the king brought with him a convoy of small boats carrying cattle, food, and personal belongings just to make sure his majesty was served in proper Arabian style. But there was one important occidental touch. One night after a sumptuous state repast, the king's servants passed among the guests a huge and magnificent metal bowl filled with rose water. In the center of the bowl, resting on a little island, was the final touch of luxury a case of Lux toilet soap. We always knew Lux toilet soap was fit for a queen, but we're happy to note that it also to the king's taste. Now, down go the lights, and up goes our coast-to-coast -coast curtain on the first act of The Suspect, starring Charles Lawton as Philip Marshall, Ella Raines as Mary Gray, Rosalind Evan as Cora, and Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons. London, in the spring of 1902, down a respectable side street, Mr. Philip Marshall comes home from work. His face is lined, his shoulders slightly stooped from years of service to the firm of Frazier and Nicholson, purveyors of tobacco. But Philip Marshall carries himself with the dignity of an honest British tradesman. At his gate, he greets his next door neighbor. Good afternoon, Mrs. Simmons. You've done wonders with your tulips. <laughs> I've a green thumb, as they say in heaven. Would you like some balls? Oh, thank you very much, but I'm afraid my wife uh, hasn't much heart for gardening. It was so good of you to bring my husband home last night. Oh, I was glad to do it. I'm sorry Gilbert carries on so when he's drinking. It must be a great trial to you. Whoa! Oh, there's a cab at your gate. Cab? Oh, excuse me. Are you the one who called the cab, Governor? No, there must be some mistake. Orders, what? They come to number 26. Well, this is 26. Just a minute. I better go in and see. Well, Mr. Philip Marshall, no loving greeting for your wife? What's the cab for, Cora? What do you think? The penny bus is good enough for me. Did John send for that cab? Right as a button, aren't you? That's just what young Hopeful did. He's clearing out bag and baggage. The selfish, ungrateful, good for nothing. What did you do to him? What did I do to him? All I did was bring him into the world, nurse him, make myself a doormat for him to walk on. That's right. Go on upstairs. Go to him. And tell him from me that when he leaves his house, he needn't think he can come crawling back. He's hurting his own mother. You'll tell him. 
Well, hello, Dad. Done packing? Uh, sorry, I'd, I'd stick it out here on your account. Well, it was bound to come. What happened? Oh, she was at me all day. I was trying to get those reports finished. It's, it's been a race at the office, you know, and I'd give my right arm for that job in Canada. Well, she got into one of her rages, grabbed the report and threw it into the fire. Twenty pages... A week's work. Have you got another place to stay? Well, I'll stay at Jimmy Estabrook's. I'm sorry, boy. Let me help you with those bags. Oh, no, thanks. I can manage. Hey, watch out for that broken step. I'll keep in touch with you, Dad. Yes. How's Sybil? Oh, oh, fine. I haven't seen her all week, though. She's a nice little thing. Is it serious between you two? <laughs> well, I... Well, it's a pity this house isn't good enough for you, John. Goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, Mother. You mealy mouth hypocrite. Two of a kind, that's what you are. I'll see you soon, Dad. I shall miss you, son. Goodbye. Well, Philip. Philip, come here. Don't you go sneaking off upstairs, running off right when I'm talking to you, just as though I were a common servant. I know what's mine to you, even if you don't. Cora, I'm moving my things into John's room. Well, of all the insulting, we're married, aren't we? Yes, we're married. Then how dare you? I forbid it. No, Cora, that's all over now that John's gone. I'm moving out of our room, and there's nothing you can do about it. What's got into you? What are you thinking Much about? It's better that you don't know, Cora. It might frighten you. Here's your chain, sir. Excellent tobacco. Fraser and Nicholson's best, and thank you, sir. Good afternoon. How did you... Mary Dew. Yes, sir. Mr. Marshall wants to see you. Go on now into his office right away. Yes, sir. Mary Dew, sir. Come in. Mary Dew, I have a very serious matter to bring to your attention. Yes, sir. I regret to say there's a penny missing from the stamp box. It, it was for a sugar bun this morning. And the tuppence yesterday, what was that for? Acid drop, sir. But I'll put it all back on payday. That's what all embezzlers plan to do. But I'm not an embezzler. Yes, but you started that way. It's the first step that counts. After, after that, it all becomes very easy. Sixpence tomorrow, half a crown the day after. Oh, but... I... I know you mean to pay it back, but you may finish by paying it back in the Portland prison quarries. Oh, don't send me to the prison quarries, please, Mr. Marshall. Well, uh, not this time, Mary Dew. Now stop sniffling. Here, take my handkerchief and wipe your eyes. A young lady to see you, Mr. Marshall. Oh, uh, run along, Mary Dill. Won't you come in, Miss... Um... Gray. Mary Gray. Miss Gray, what can I do for you? I... I'm seeking employment. Work? Here? Selling tobacco? I mean office work. I can take dictation. We're quite satisfied with our young men. Well, some of our young men have been with us here for 30 or 40 years. I see. I'm so, well, I'm so sorry. I think you might have better luck at a draper's establishment. I, I, I've tried. I, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, Stanton. Yes, sir? Might as well lock up. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. The days are getting longer now. Yes, I've got a good mind to walk home. It'll be nice walking through the park at this time of day. Good evening, Mr. Marshall. Oh, good evening, officer. We're going to have a lovely sunset. Yes, it'll be a fine evening. I thought... Hello. What's the matter with her? Her, sir? A girl on the bench. She's crying. <laughs> so she is. I usually let them cry it out. It does them good. Evening, sir. Evening. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Is there anything I can do? No. Go away, please. Leave me alone. Why, hello, Miss Gray. Oh, oh, Mr. Marshall. I don't mean to intrude, but I... Oh, you're very of... kind. I'm afraid I'm behaving rather badly. Oh, now, now, now. Come, come, come. It can't be as bad as all that. You know, I'm really sorry about the work in my office, oh, Miss Gray. it wasn't just that. I was feeling a bit down. All at once it came over me how terribly alone I am. You see, my father died in the winter. And there were just the two of us. Well, I know how it is to be lonely, and I know that it can be faced. Does that make you feel any better? Ever so much. Where are you going? Home. Oh, I see. A cup of tea, a sixpenny novel, and a good long cry. I'm afraid you've been looking in at my window. Hmm. Shall we pool our loneliness? What do you mean? 
Oh, go somewhere and have a bite of dinner and a talk. You know, I'm sure that I know someone who needs a clever young lady to take dictation. Well, I... Why don't you join me just for this evening? You might enjoy it. It'd be a great kindness to me. Well, I'm sure it would be to me. But aren't you on your way to someone? Someone? No. No, there's no one. I know a nice little Chinese restaurant on Malvern Street. Now, come on, we'll get a cab. You know, it was really good of you to take me on trust. Oh, not altogether on trust. I overheard you in your office with that little boy. Married you? The one you're not going to send to prison. He's a desperate character, don't you think? Oh, so desperate I wanted to hug him. That's the danger with his type. They get round you, huh? You were so gentle with him. Gentle? My dear Miss Gray, you will discover in time that I have a heart of stone. Did you enjoy the dinner? I loved it. But I'm afraid I'll never learn to eat with chopsticks. Well, you know the answer to that one. Practice. We must eat here often after this. Two tickets, please, the stalls. Philip, aren't you being frightfully expensive? You forget, we saved sixpence sitting in the pit last night. Oh, Philip. <laughs> he plays beautifully, doesn't he? Beautifully. It's been so long since I've been to a concert. We'll come again next week. Well, here we are. My rooming house, Philip. Good night. I've had such a good time. These have been the happiest weeks I can remember, Mary. Oh, you say the nicest things, Philip. You do the nicest things. What have I done now? Have you forgotten that you got me my job at Winwood's? I don't remember a thing about it. All I remember is we're having dinner tomorrow night. Oh, Philip. Philip, I can't. Why not? Mrs. Packer, I've told you about her. She works at Winwood's. Oh, she's been frightfully nice. I've asked her and her husband to have dinner with me. Oh, I but, see. but listen, why don't you come along? I'd like so much to have you I'd meet like them. to, Mary. Oh, now I... come along, now, Philip. Now, Mary, listen. You and I are pretty good friends, hmm? The best. We've had a lot of fun together. Can't we go on just like this, just the two of us? Why is it, Philip, that you don't ever like to meet anyone? Oh, I don't know. A chap my age has a right to a few peculiarities. And... I know there's something if you'd only tell me. Nothing to tell. Well, as you wish. Good night, Philip. Mary, what about the night after? You know I'll say yes. Good night. Good night, Mary. Cora? Cora, you awake? Cora, I know you're not asleep. I saw you lie down from the street. Cora! Oh, it's you, Philip. Come in. <laughs> Flattered, I'm sure. I like the key to my bedroom, Cora. You've locked the door. Where have you been? My key, please. Answer me. You were out with that good for nothing from next door, weren't you? Cora, please. Don't try to deny it. I heard him staggering home just now, and you were with him. Yes, Cora, I brought Gilbert Simmons home. I ran into him in front of a pub. He was drunk as usual and causing trouble. And what business is that of yours? Cora, hasn't his poor wife enough to put up with as it is? His poor wife? Oh. What about your poor wife? How much longer do you think I'm going to stand for this coming in at all hours? For the whole street's beginning to gossip, and I'm not going to be made an object of pity in front of my friends, do you hear me? I'm sorry, Cora, if people choose to embarrass oh, you. Oh, a I... lot you care. What have I ever done to deserve this? What ever possessed me to tie myself up to a poor stick like you? Walk through the forest and pick the crooked tree. That's what I did. A fat, ugly, crooked tree. And I don't care if I never hear an ugly voice again. Cora, don't you know the neighbors can hear every word you say? I don't care. I've nothing to be ashamed if of. If we could only talk quietly, come to some sort of understanding, Cora. Now, look, we've never been happy together, not once, in all the years that we've been married. I know whose fault is that, I'd like to know. It isn't anybody's fault. Over and over again, we've tried that when two people are shut up together and they don't love each other, Everything they do becomes hateful just because they do it. Oh, so that's it, is it? You hate me. You've always hated me. Cora, I did not say that. Will you please listen to me? All I say is that we've got some good years ahead of us, both of us. Why can't we live them happily? 
apart from each other. Apart? What do you mean? Let me go, Cora. Divorce? Yes. Divorce? Never in my life have I heard of anything so immoral. Divorce, indeed. Oh, no. I'm not going to be laughed at. A woman who couldn't hold a husband. Just for that, you'd ruin both our lives. We are married. And we'll stay married till death do us part. Do you hear me? Well, my mind's made up, Cora. If you won't divorce me, I'm going to leave you. Oh, you are, are you? Well, you just try. Just you try it. I'll go down to your precious shop and I'll tell your noble customers what sort you are. I knew it was no use talking to you. There's no way out, is there? Oh, yes, there is for you, Mr. Philip Marshall. Out of your shop. Out of your job. Ha! Won't I love seeing their faces when I tell them that their very respectable manager, Mr. Philip Marshall, wants to desert his own wife. And I will tell them, so help me! <laughs> Philip, you haven't eaten a thing, aren't you well? Oh, I'm all right. Did anything happen on your way here? You were so late. No. But you're not like yourself tonight. What is it? I've been wanting to tell you all evening, Mary. After tonight, we can't see each other anymore. What did you say? I said we mustn't see each other ever again. Oh. Don't look like that. Philip, we're such good friends. It's meant so much to me. It's meant everything to me. Well, then... Don't you think I deserve to know? Tell me, Philip. I've behaved very badly, Mary. Do you remember the first time that we met, I told you that I had no attachments and no ties of any kind? Philip, you're married, aren't you? Yes. It wasn't very fair, was it? No. I was afraid you'd never see me again, and I was so sure that my wife would give me a divorce. Won't she? No. This is our last time together. You've risked too much already. But, Philip, please, we're only friends. We're hurting no one. Is there anything wrong just seeing each other? She followed me here tonight, or she tried to. Your wife? Yes. I managed to shake her off finally, but sooner or later she'll find out, and I'm... Well, I'm not afraid for myself of what she might do to you. She must... I'm much too fond of you, Mary. What a pity this had to happen now. I hope your Christmas will be happier than mine. Christmas? It's only two weeks away. Well, we can still drink a toast. Mary, my dear, to you. My dear, my very dear. Cora, come here. I've got something to show you, Cora. It's a Christmas tree. Well, couldn't you find a better way to waste your money? It'll help to cheer us up. Christmas comes but once a year. And where will you hang the mistletoe? Mistletoe? What? Aren't you going to kiss me under the mistletoe? You could shut your eyes, you know, and pretend I was somebody else. There's no one else, Cora. No? Wouldn't it be better if we try to make things a little pleasanter? Try to make this place a little more like home? Oh, I heard from John today. He may be going to Canada soon. Oh? thinking about your family, aren't you, love? No more evenings at the pub. No more office work to keep you out late. A real little family man. You'll help a bit, won't you? There's no place like home, is there? Now, since that creature threw you out... Cora. And don't tell me there was no such person. Winwoods, that's where she works. Melbourne Crescent, that's where she lives. And Mary Gray, that's her filthy name. Well, why don't you try to deny it? It's true, Cora, but it's all over and done with. Is it? Not for me, it isn't. I'm going down to the filthy shop and show you up for what you are. Cora, no! And I'll do the same for her. I'll go to the house where she lives, I'll go to the place where she works, and I'll let them know the low creature she is. Cora, you're driving me... I'll drive you both into the gutter where you belong. And as sure as the sun rises tomorrow, I'll give her a merry Christmas she'll never forget. <laughs> Afraid now, aren't you? <laughs> afraid for her. No, not afraid for her. Not for her. Why, Mr. Marshall? Mrs. Uh, Simmons, please. It's my, my, my wife. W would you go for the doctor? Your wife? What's wrong? Well, there's been an accident, I'm afraid. I... I'm afraid she's dead. He 
In just a moment, Thomas Mitchell and our stars will return in Act Two of The Suspect. I believe everyone will recognize this game. Gosh, Mary, that's good bowling. Beginner's luck. I'll probably never do it again, but here goes. Oh. Oh, never mind, honey. Gosh, you look cute with your cheeks all pink like that. Say, don't worry about your score. You sure bowled me over. Yes, Lux girls are winners when it comes to romance. Smooth, radiant skin never fails to charm. These clever girls take their complexion tip from Hollywood. They do what famous screen stars do. Depend on active lather facials with fine white Lux toilet soap every single day. Lovely Jean Tierney tells you how she takes her Lux soap beauty facials. I cover my face generously with a creamy lather and work it gently in. I rinse with warm water, then cold, and pat my skin dry with a soft towel. It's the way to really lovely skin. It's a fact. Hollywood's active lather facials really do make skin softer, smoother. In recent tests of Lux soap facials, actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time. Why don't you try them? Begin tomorrow to give your skin this gentle, cherishing care nine out of ten screen stars, lovely women everywhere, find so effective. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Two of The Suspect, starring Charles Lawton as Philip, Ella Raines as Mary, Rosalind Even as Cora, and Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons. It's several hours later, while the neighborhood buzzes with the tragic news of Mrs. Marshall's sudden death, an early morning visitor fills out a routine report. I've hated to ask these questions, Mr. Marshall, when you're so upset and all. That's all right, Constable. The police department has its regulations. Everything you've told me checks with the doctor's story. The deceased was coming down the stairway. She tripped on the broken step, suffering fatal injuries when her head struck the ballast. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. That's all I need. Another day has passed. The funeral is over, and departing callers mumble sympathy to Philip and his son, John. Last to leave is their next-door neighbor, Mrs. Simmons. I don't know what we would have done without you, Mrs. Simmons, these past two days. No, it's been nothing, Mr. Marshall. After all you've done for Gilbert and for me. Take good care of your father, John. I will. He looks so tired. Have you slept at all? Oh, I think perhaps I'll sleep tonight. You must. And I've brought you this. It's Dexter's anodyne, a sedative. Sedative? Rather afraid of drugs. Nonsense. Dexter's anodyne. Just five drops in a glass of water puts you right to sleep. It isn't dangerous, is it? Not if you're careful not to take too much. Just five drops. I'll try it, Father. It might help That's you. It's very good of you, Mrs. Simmons. Good night. Good night, John. Good night, Mrs. Simmons. Well, Father? Well, boy? I, I wish there was something I could do. Oh, I'll manage. You've borne up wonderfully. I, I'm proud of you. You run along, John. It's getting late. You sure you don't want me to stay? No. I'll get along fine. <sighs> Poor mother. I I just want you to know, Dad, that you've nothing to reproach yourself with. No one ever tried harder than you. It might rain. You better take an umbrella. Maybe I'd better. I I say, Dad, where's your walking stick? You know, the one with the heavy handle? I don't know. I must have left it somewhere. Doesn't matter. Good night, Dad. Good night. Mr. Philip Marshall? Yes? Yeah? I'm sorry to intrude at such a time, Mr. Marshall. I'm Inspector Huxley, Scotland Yard. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Come in. Questions about what? The death of your wife. Why oh, I answered all those questions. Yes, I read the reports quite thoroughly. The coroner called it accident. Mr. Marshall, there was some insurance in your wife's name, 3,000 pounds. Yes, we both took out policies some years ago. Lots of people do that. 
Is this the stairway where the accident occurred? Yes. Do you mind if I look about? Not at all. Oh, this broken step. This is the step she tripped on, I suppose. Yes, that's right. You should have a thing like that repaired. We meant to have it repaired a long time ago. And that's the room she came out of? No, that's my room. Hers is on the other side. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, it's much clearer now. It's much better than trying to visualize things from the written report. Imagine it must be. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is this where she struck her head? Yes, the baluster was broken. So you had it replaced with a new one? Yes, I couldn't bear the sight. Why do you make a point of that? Oh, no particular reason. Only it seems curious. We find the broken step unrepaired, but the baluster is replaced immediately. What are you trying to suggest? Suggest? Nothing. But let's suppose, purely from my point of view, that it was not an accident. That someone had made up his mind to do away with his wife, for reasons only he knew. But it had to be done. Now, let's suppose he took one of these canes, the heaviest. Then he went up these stairs, very quietly. He came to this broken step... Perhaps he pulled the carpet loose a little to make sure that it looked broken. Now he's in the darkness of the upper hallway. He puts his hand over his mouth so that his voice seems to come from a distance. Cora, he calls, and again, Cora. Her door opens. For a moment she stands there, grumbling and wondering why the whole light isn't burning. Maybe she cries sharply, what's the matter? He holds his breath. She stands so near. Her voice calls once more, Philip, are you all right? His hand tightens on the stick. She passes him. She goes downstairs one, two, three steps. It's now or never. He raises the stick. The blow falls, and he follows her as she crashes. She isn't dead yet, but she has to die. Slowly, he raises the stick. Stop and... it! How dare you say I killed my wife? How dare you? I'm sorry, Mr. Marshall. I merely said if your wife was murdered, it could have happened that way. It could have happened that way, but it didn't. You haven't a shred of evidence. But it is an interesting point of view. Now, now, if only we could find something, some, some little something as a motive. Uh, you understand what I mean, Mr. Marshall? No, I don't. No? Well, good night, Mr. Marshall. Philip, it's been such a long time. A whole month since you wrote me that you... Since you told me of your trouble. I didn't dare to meet you, Mary. Even tonight, I'm afraid they may be watching me. They may have followed me to this restaurant. But can't you see how frightfully unfair it is to let the outrageous suspicions of stupid policemen keep us apart? Mary, I couldn't have you mixed up in this sort of thing. But what are people for, people you love? Can't you see that if you were in trouble, I'd want to share it's it? Not that kind of trouble. Just to be suspected leaves a mark. All right. Let it leave a mark on both of us. Because I don't intend to let you go again. Mary. With the compliments of the house, sir. Our best wine. Well, it's very good to see you again, sir, if I may say so. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Shall I pour it? By all means. This is an occasion. You see, Philip? They missed us. Mary. <laughs> my dear. My very dear. wish to see me? Miss Gray, I'm sorry to bother you at your home. I'm Inspector Huxley, Scotland Yard. I'd like to talk to you about Philip Marshall. Go on. We know you've been meeting lately. In fact, he left you at this doorway last night. How long have you known Mr. Marshall? Since last May. Well, surely you knew he was married, yet you continue to meet him frequently. What are you driving at? What are you trying to find out? It's quite possible that Mrs. Marshall was murdered by her husband. Philip Marshall, a murderer? Nonsense. I think you're making a fool of yourself, Inspector. Well, what you think isn't evidence, miss. But you've admitted meeting Mr. Marshall, and that's very valuable evidence. In finding you, we found the motive we've been looking for. You'll be called as a witness for the Crown, Miss Gray. Not Miss Gray, Inspector. Mrs. Philip Marshall. We were married this morning. Oh, I see. <laughs> a very shrewd move, wasn't it? A wife can't be made to testify against her husband. You know, it's a very funny thing, but we never thought of that. Didn't you really? No. <laughs> and it's just coincidence that you silence the only witness whose testimony might hang you. Philip, must we listen to this? No, we mustn't. Inspector, you're getting rather tiresome with your accusations. 
We don't intend to listen to them any longer. Is that clear? Well, don't you think that an innocent man might be more understanding? I think an innocent man might behave precisely as I have. Well, I'm sorry. I can't agree with you. Well, then here I am. Why don't you arrest me? I'd like to, believe me. Yes, but you've run into a blank wall. You take my advice and don't beat your head against it. Please understand, Mr. Marshall. I have a job to do. It's completely impersonal, and I might have been wrong about the whole thing. If I have, I'm very sorry. Very well. Let's forget it. May I wish you a most successful marriage and a long one? Thank you. Darling, you must hurry. John and Sybil are here. They're waiting downstairs. Sybil, what's she like, She's a little bit on the light side, possibly, but she's very pretty. Anyway, she's John's first girl, and I hope you'll like her. Oh, I'll do my best. But John's like you, a very precious prize for any woman. Now, that's enough of that. You come along now. Your train for Margate leaves in 40 minutes. Oh, what a pity you aren't coming with us. I'll be down tomorrow morning. Hope the weather clears. Well, if it doesn't, we'll come back tonight. I hate the seashore when it's raining. Well, I've got to run along to the shop. Have a good time. Goodbye, darling. Don't forget to feed the cat. Margaret? Margaret? Another cherry tart, please. Another cherry tart, Mr. Marshall, and you on a strict diet. I know, but it's Saturday and my family's at the beach and I must, I've got to work in a stuffy shop. I need some consolation. Very well, another cherry tart. Oh, hello, Marshall. May your, your dissolute neighbor sit down? Oh, hello, Simmons, I suppose so. Thank you. Well, since you press me, I'll have a spot of whiskey. Oh, uh, miss, a double whiskey and soda. Yes, sir. You can forget that cherry tart, Margaret. Oh, don't tell me I've spoiled your appetite. Since you press me, you have. Yeah. You are not irresistibly drawn to me, are you? No, I'm not. I saw your wife this morning. She said she'd cut her eye stumbling against a door. Well, wives get tiresome at times, you know. I know this. You've got to stop knocking her about. No, it's easy for you to talk with a nice new wife and a very pretty one. <laughs> All beer and Skittles now, isn't it? I'm very happy, if that's what you mean. And by the same token, I'm not. It's your own fault. Oh, I quite agree. It, it so happens I'm a rotter by nature, a complete rotter. Why can't you get a hold of yourself? You're still young. You've a charming wife. And no money. Uh, uh, you couldn't let me have a fiver, could you? Uh, just until my wife's allowance comes due? Not a brass farthing, at least not until you go to work. Work? My dear Marshal, work is for the working man. There, that'll pay for your drink. Goodbye. Thanks. <laughs> Shopkeeper. Miss, where's that drink? Coming, sir. Some changeable weather, isn't it, Mr. Simmons? Filthy. Uh, who are you? Inspector Huxley. Oh, miss, bring the gentleman another drink. Thanks. Are you the police chap who came asking questions after Mrs. Marshall's death? That's right. Who are you stalking now? Your neighbor, Mr. Philip Marshall. I beg your pardon? What was that? Did it ever occur to you that Mrs. Marshall's death might not have been an accident? Do you mind saying that again? You interest me. You don't know how much you interest me. Pussy, puss, 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 puss. Come on, pussy. Puss, 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 puss. Nice bell of... Oh. Well, Marshall... Left all alone to mind the cat, eh? I found your back door open, so I thought I'd come in and continue our chats. Chat with you is something I could do without. I've got a pack. I'm going to mark it in the morning. Will the weather turn this beastly? I'm clear by morning, so if you'll no, excuse me, No, 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 no. Come, go. surely. Surely you've a moment for a reformed character. Hmm? I've decided to go to work. I've got an idea, and I'd, uh, I'd like your opinion. Yes? It's a good idea, with a bit of luck. Luck is important, don't you think? No, I don't. A man makes his own opportunities. Well, you ought to know. What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Only your wife died most conveniently. Wasn't, uh, wasn't that luck pure and simple? Now, look here, Simmons. Mrs. Look, Marshall uh... dies, and you come into a pot of money, and the coroner says, unfortunate accident. Now, I call that lucky. Get out! But Inspector Huxley doesn't seem quite satisfied that Mrs. Marshall's death was accidental. Huxley... Huxley thinks that you, uh, shall we say, helped your wife to a better land. But he can't prove it. He needs a witness. Does he? And I need ten pounds. You are a swine, aren't you? In these houses, the walls are very thin, you know. That's how I, 
how I happened to hear you and your wife arguing that night. You heard nothing. But suppose I were to swear that I did. Suppose I were to swear that I heard her cry out. You didn't. That I heard the blow. You're lying. That I heard her say, Philip, don't. No one had ever believed Possibly, you. but it might put you in a very awkward position if uh, I were to give evidence for the Crown. Hmm. Yes, it might. You're quite right. Might put me in a very awkward position. Well, here's five pounds. It's all I've got with me. Well, the banks will be open on Monday. On Monday, I'd like 25 pounds. Another 25 next week? Mm-hmm. I'd think that reasonable. And the week after that, and the week after that. Oh, I'll, I'll let you down as lightly as I can. Uh, I say, have you got such a thing as a, as a spot of whiskey in the house? Whiskey? Mm hmm Uh... Yes. Should be a bottle somewhere in the pantry. I'll go and fetch it. Now, the bottle. Bring the bottle. <laughs> you know, Marshal, you're taking this very sensibly. Well, you won't regret it. After all, you, you've got a lot to lose, even if you do have to stay at home and mind a filthy cat. Marshal. Yes? What the devil are you doing? Measuring out that whiskey? Bring it in here. I'm sorry. I had a little trouble finding it. Here you are. Help yourself. One glass? Aren't you going to have a... <laughs> oh, well. <sighs> oh, that's pretty foul whiskey. Did it ever occur to you, Simmons, that blackmail might be dangerous? Not if you know your man. <sighs> and I know you, Marshal, like a book. I say, don't you ever show any fight? No, I've never been a fighter. <laughs> Soft, like that kitten. Turn the other cheek, reward in the hereafter. I like people, and I've never wanted to hurt them. And that's a great mistake. Do you suppose I ever worry whether I tread on the other fellow's toes? No. I don't suppose you do. <sighs> there you are. And here I am, sweet and cozy for life. <laughs> or for as long as your life lasts. This rotten whiskey, Marshal. <laughs> Shopkeeper's whiskey. <coughs> it's hot, isn't it? You see, Marshal, your lot were created to make life easier for my sort. Meek inherit the earth, and we inherit the meek. <laughs> Not bad. <coughs> Whiskey's bad, though. It Tastes, tastes like, like... Dexter's anodyne, perhaps. De Dexter's... Never heard of it. You're a coward, Marshal. That's how I got you. <coughs> no more fight than a sheep. You couldn't kill a, a fly. Oh, the, the whiskey, you, you, you poison. Oh, I can't, I can't. In just a moment, our stars will be back with Act Three of The Suspect. Meanwhile... Here's Mrs. Smith getting some extra special help in her kitchen. Oh, Jim, you don't need to bother with those dishes. I want you to rest while you're home. These are a cinch, Mom, for anybody who's done KP. Hey, don't throw that fat away. Why? It's only a little scrap left on this plate. They wouldn't let you get away with that in the Army, Mom. Why, they even save the soup skimmings and render down every bit of leftover solid fat. All you have to do is melt it in the oven, you know. Is it really that important, Jim? They tell us there's enough fat thrown away right in this country every year to equal what we used to import from the Far East. And boy, we sure need that used fat. Yes, we do need that used fat desperately. And most of it will have to come from the kitchens of America. Our pre-war imports of a billion pounds a year have been cut off. We need fat for literally thousands of uses on the war front. On the home front, too. For instance... Used fats help to make munitions, medicines, military and civilian soaps, synthetic rubber, 
and coatings to protect ships, tanks, and fabrics. But with meat so scarce, how can I save more? By saving every single drop of used grease, no matter how burnt or black. Render down all scraps. That's very important. Keep a tin can handy on the stove. Rush it to your butcher when it's full. If you live in a rural district and have trouble in disposing of your used fats, call your county agent or home demonstration agent. And remember, for every pound you turn in, your butcher will give you four cents and two red ration points. Your government needs your help in this vital matter. Won't you save and turn in all you can? We return to Thomas Mitchell and our stars. Act Three of The Suspect. Starring Charles Lawton as Philip, Ella Raines as Mary, Rosalind Even as Cora, and Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons. Only a few minutes have passed since the lifeless body of Gilbert Simmons crumpled at Philip Marshall's feet. Calmly and thoroughly, Philip has started to remove all evidence. The whiskey bottle, the glass, the vial of Dexter's anodyne. But suddenly, he freezes in terror. Voices he quickly recognizes are clamoring at the front door. Dad, we're home, Dad. We're home, Dad. Dad, we're back. And very wet, Sybil and I are drenched. Hello in there. Dad, let us in. Unlock the door. He has no time to think. Dragging Simmons' body to the parlor, Marshall hides it under the sofa, and then, collecting his shattered nerves, he opens the front door. Hello, Philip. Hello, darling. Hi, Sybil. Hi, John. Hurry in, all of you. We're soaked. Sorry I took so long. I was upstairs. Oh, our whole weekend spoiled. Oh, this miserable rain. Does it always rain at Margaret? Always when we go there. Let's go in the parlor. We can start a fire. Parlor? Yes, why not? A fire and, and a spot of something to warm us up. Yes, of course. A, a double spot to warm us up, eh, Sybil? <laughs> oh, John, you're awful. You know we have to catch that bus. You two just make yourselves at home. Philip, whiskey's in the cupboard, isn't it? Philip! Yes? Oh, come on, help me find the whiskey. I'm sorry, darling, but there isn't any. Oh, Philip, is that what you do when my back is turned? How about some sherry? Fine. It's right here. Shame you had such bad weather. Oh, well, it was lonely without you anyway. Well, we'll try it again before long. Come now, help me take these glasses in. Oh, Sybil, I'm not going to bite you. Come on. <laughs> Look at those two lovebirds on the sofa. Yes, they... Philip, what's the matter? Nothing. Ah, liquid sometime to replace the real thing, eh? Sybil? Thank you, Mr. Marshall. John? Oh, I'll share Sybil. <laughs> no, you won't either. <laughs> now, John, this... <gasps> What's the matter? Oh, something, something touched me. Something's under the sofa. Oh, Sybil, what nonsense. Oh, but it did my ankle. What an imagination. Oh, but I'm sure of it. Right, now, don't get excited. Here, here, let me reach under. John. By, by Jove, there is. There is something under there. Oh, <laughs> and here's your spook, the cat. <laughs> <laughs> a cat. <laughs> How silly of me. Oh, oh Sybil, six o'clock, our bus. Oh, dear, I'm dreadfully sorry, but, but we must run. Of course, only come again soon, Sybil. <laughs> oh, it was ever so nice of you, Mrs. Marshall. Mr. Marshall. <laughs> come, John. Here now, take an umbrella. Thanks, Dad. Good night, Mary. Good night. Good night. Philip, I believe John's really smitten. I dare say she's a pretty little thing. Oh, but hardly a thought in her head. I should hate to see him throw himself away like that. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't I what? You weren't listening. Oh, I'm sorry. Philip, you look positively done in. Has anything happened? Of course not. Don't try to put me off. You've got something on your mind. Well, as a matter of fact, I... Oh, come on now. No secrets between us. All right, Mary, no secrets. How would it be if we packed up and went off with John? What do you mean? Well, I mean to leave London, to leave England, go off with John to Canada. Canada? Might be fun, rather. The more I think of the idea, the more I like it. You haven't been happy here, have you? Well, it... I thought when we had the house done over that you'd forget. It's no use, is it? You mustn't blame yourself, Mary. I'd be happy anywhere with you. Thank you, darling. Do you want to know something? Nothing would please me more than to leave this house. We'd be much better off any place else in the world. You mean that? 
Let's go with John. It's a wonderful idea. I'm so happy I could dance. Now, look here, my girl. You're dancing off to bed. You've had a long, hard day. Oh, but I want to clear things up. I'll clear everything up. There's only these few glasses. Now, run along with you. All right, dear. Pleasant dreams. I'll dream about Canada. You won't be long down there. Now, don't wait for me. I've got a few things to do. Good night, dear. <laughs> Well, goodbye, Mr. Marshall. I don't know what the firm will do without you. Well, it's very nice of you, Stanton. You've all been so wonderfully kind with the walking stick and the inscription. And... Mr. Fraser himself composed it. You're sailing tomorrow, sir? Yes, I can hardly believe it. Well, I expect you're eager to get away, especially now. How do you mean, especially now? I mean, uh, with all that's been going on next door to you... Mm. I read in the papers about your neighbor disappearing. Oh, Simmons, of course, it's not the first time that he's dropped out of sight. Been gone a week now, though. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's cousin lives in the next street, you know. Uh, the police have been there. Uh, who saw Gilbert Summers come? Who saw him go? Who saw him last? I expect they've been seeing you, too. The police? No, no, not yet. That's odd. And you, his next-door neighbor? You'll say goodbye to Merritt, you for me, won't you? I'm so sorry to not oh, see him. Oh, the lad's on an errand. He'll be heartbroken, but I'll tell him, sir. Thank you. Goodbye. Good luck to all your family. Oh, won't you come in? I just dropped in to say goodbye, Mrs. Simmons, and to thank you for giving our cat a home. But I've always loved animals. And now that I'm alone so much... Have you uh, had any news of Gilbert? Not a word. Oh, I suppose this latest disappearance is the talk of every gossip in the neighborhood. Well, you know, when you get the police hanging about, it does set a lot of tongues wagging. I wish there was something I could do. You've always been so very kind, but there's nothing anybody can do. Sometimes when Gilbert goes away like this, I, I almost wish he wouldn't come back. I'd go and stay with my sister and her children in Devon, but oh, it's only a dream. He always does come back. I can't tell you how sorry I am, Mrs. Simmons, and I think we know each other well enough for me to say that I hope that someday soon you'll be able to go back to Devon. Five more minutes till we sail. I can't believe it. My heart's thumping so. Oh, where did John go? John's below in the purse's office, taking care of the tickets. Mary, Mary, you're sure you won't regret this. Regret it? Oh, darling, we're going to be terribly happy in Canada. You and Philip I and John. I feel that, Philip too. Marshall. Listen, isn't Mr. that for Philip you? Mr. Marshall. Mr. Marshall. Oh, Stuart. I'm Mr. Marshall. Oh, there's a gentleman here to see you, Mr. Marshall. Who is he? What's his name? I'm sorry, sir. Mr. I... Marshall, it's me. Oh, Mary, to you. Mr. Marshall, I didn't want you to sail, sir, without saying goodbye. Mary, this is my fellow worker, Mary Dew. I'm very glad to know you. I brought you a present, Mr. Marshall. A present? It's a sorbent remedy for mal de mer. Seasickness, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> I bought it with my own money. That was very thoughtful of you, Mary Dew, wasn't it, Mary? Indeed it was. Well, take good care of it. And I wish you the best of luck and health, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> and, um, uh, you, Mum? And, um... I'm very much beholden to you, and um, Mother says how she hopes I'll grow to be as good a man as you are. Well, I don't know about being good, Mary Jo, but if you're half as happy as I am. Oh, well, I'd best be going, sir. Mary Jo, come here. Now, look at me. Would you promise me that you'll be a good boy, always? And here's a present for you. Oh, thank you, sir. And, Mum, goodbye. Goodbye, Mary Jo. Hmm. Oh, here you are. Oh, are the tickets all right, son? We're all straightened out, but the baggage, I never saw so many bags. They're all in your stateroom, mm -hmm. and my pullover's in one of them, and I don't know which. I'll help you find it, laddie. Come along. Coming, Philip? I think I'll step down to the lounge and have a drink. Have one for me, too. Yes, sir? What's yours, sir? Scotch and soda. Scotch and soda, yes, sir. Well, well, hello there, Marshal. Inspector Huxley. Yes. Turn up everywhere, don't you? <laughs> yes, it does seem so. Are you sailing or seeing somebody off? Sailing. Good. Marvelous country, Canada. I came down to see an old friend off, name of Pennyfeather. Hope you meet him. I dare say he'll see to that. What do you mean? 
Oh, <laughs> you think he's one of our men? Of course I do. Oh, nonsense. Your wife's death was an accident. The case is closed. Well, goodbye and good luck. Oh, by the way, have you seen the afternoon paper? No. That missing neighbor of yours, Gilbert Simmons. What about Simmons? He's turned up at last. You don't say so. Yes. Let's see now. What page is it? Ah, here we are. See? A man's body found. A body identified as Gilbert Simmons of 28 Laburnum Terrace was taken last night from the muddy waters of a canal. While first indications pointed to suicide, police believe Simmons may have been murdered. Dear me. They sure it's Simmons? Oh, quite. It's him, all right. Oh, ghastly. Must have fallen in the canal when he was tight. No, he was thrown in when he was dead. You mean to tell me he was murdered? In cold blood. Poisoned. Oh, how shocking. You know who did it? What? You know who did it? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Who? Uh, his wife. No. Oh, yes. Perfectly clear case. She had a motive, you know. He was a first-class rotter. He used to knock her about. She admits it. And besides, the stuff they found in his stomach was identical with some sleeping drug that she had in the house. Anodyne. But that's absurd. That woman couldn't have dragged the body to the canal. Well, why not? It's only a few feet to the end of the garden. She wouldn't have had the strength. Oh, my dear chap. When it's a matter of finding strength or swinging on the gallows... Oh, it won't come to that. No jury would convict her. They'll convict her without even getting out of the box. Do you realize she hasn't any alibi? Why, she was in the house the whole time. Oh, I say, I, I didn't mean to upset you. I didn't dream that... She's innocent. Oh, really? Uh, have you any proof? No, but you can't live next door to a person for eight years without knowing something about them. Oh, my dear Marshal, when it comes to knowing what's in other people's hearts... Oh, there's my man now. Oh, Pennyfeather, coming. Well, goodbye, old chap. Now, don't let it worry you. It's no affair of yours, you know. Bon voyage. Your whiskey, sir. Well, there goes the ship, Inspector, and I must say, begging your pardon, I don't understand your methods. What methods? Philip Marshall kills a man in cold blood and we let him sail away. Just like that. Well, Sergeant, what else could I do? If Marshall killed Simmons, it must have been because he also killed his wife. He was afraid Simmons would testify. Of course. That's what we hoped for. Yes, but with Simmons dead, we haven't a chance to prove a thing. So he gets clean out of our hands. He never was in our hands. The other way around, if anything. There's only one thing that'll bring him to heel, and that's his own sense of decency. Decency? A murderer? Philip Marshall's not a killer, not by nature. He's a man just the same as you and I. Hmm. That's the reason I gave him that cooked-up story about Mrs. Simmons. He believed every word. He thinks we really believe she killed her husband. I, I felt sure he wouldn't let an innocent woman suffer for a thing he did himself, but... Ah, but it looks as though I was wrong, doesn't it? I would have made a bet that you were wrong all the time. Sergeant, do you still want to bet? Look, it's him. It's Marshall. My hat's off to you, Inspector. Thank you, Sergeant. Shall I grab him? No. He's getting away. No, no, he isn't. He thinks he's done a pretty big thing. Let's leave him alone. He'll come to us when, when he's ready. Just keep on, an eye on him in the meantime. Capsir. What? What did you say? Take you somewhere? Uh, take me somewhere. Oh, yes. Where to, Governor? Scotland Yard. Deserved applause for our stars who have made the suspects so exciting an experience. Charles Lawton, Ella Raines, and Rosalind Evan. You know, uh, Rosalind, you were so convincing that if Charles hadn't murdered you, I think I'd have stepped in and done it myself. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Although it's a sort of doubtful compliment. Actually, <laughs> Rosalind is a very sweet and sympathetic lady, Tommy. Oh, I'm sure of that. Oh, incidentally, Charles, I hear you lost weight making the suspect. You hear? Wouldn't it be better if you said, I see you've lost weight? <laughs> uh, 
Well, let's leave it the way it was. Actually, I did. It was a strenuous party motion. <laughs> And Ella put on several pounds. How do you account for that? Well, you know, women, they're always contradictory. <laughs> How'd you do, Rosalind? Gain or lose? Oh, I held my own. Actually, it was a very great experience making that picture, wasn't it, Ella? Uh-huh. You know, as manager of a tobacco shop during the picture, Charles could help himself to all the cigarettes he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad it wasn't a drug or grocery store. Then you could have helped yourself to Lux toilet soap. You certainly slipped that in fast, Tommy. <laughs> oh, that wouldn't have been necessary, Tommy. We have our own supply of Lux toilet soap, both Rosalind and I. <laughs> and use it regularly, I may add. Proving you're wise as well as charming. <laughs> and the best way I know of saying thank you is to tell you what we've got for next week, which is something rather special. It's the unusual and gripping universal screen hit Only Yesterday, and we're starring Ida Lupino and Robert Young. This is the story of a man, a man on the brink of ruin, who remembers a girl he once loved long ago, a girl who has carried the torch for him through many bitter years of separation. And with that memory, his hand is stayed from suicide and his life rededicated to a new goal and an old love. Sounds like a fine play, Tommy. Indeed it does. I wouldn't want to miss it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And thanks to all of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ida Lupino and Robert Young in Only Yesterday. This is Thomas Mitchell saying good night from Hollywood. Charles Lawton and Ella Raines appeared through the cooperation of Universal Pictures, producers of Walter Wanger's Salome, Where She Danced. Thomas Mitchell appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, who are celebrating their 30th anniversary. He can soon be seen in Captain Eddie. Heard in tonight's play were Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons, Lester Matthews as Huxley, and Truda Marson, Norman Field, Anthony Ellis, Eric Snowden, Tommy Cook, Alec Harford, Charles Seal, Claire Verdera, Gloria Gordon, and Tom Collins. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Only Yesterday with Ida Lupino and Robert Young. It's spry for cakes, spry for pies, spry for all you bake and fry. Yes, spry is top-notch for baking and frying. But have you tried spry in white sauces for enriching vegetables? Save butter for table only. Use spry for all your cooking. Remember, there's a word for pure all-vegetable shortening at its creamy best. Spry, S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater present.